Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, warshippers of all ages, welcome back to YouTube. My name is Sea Raptor, and today let's keep going with our Learn to Play series for the Japanese heavy cruisers. Let's take a look at Tier 8's Mogami. Mogami is... Well, Mogami has one of the weirdest histories in this game. I could probably do an entire video just about the sordid history of Mogami. And it all comes down to the fact that historically, Mogami was laid down, constructed, and launched as a light cruiser. Originally, this ship was equipped with five triple-barreled 155mm guns, and that is, of course, when you buy a stock Mogami in World of Warships, that's the ship that you get. But of course, one of the things that you can do to the ship is you can pay to upgrade the gun module from 155 to 203 millimeters. But there's a whole host of things that come along with that that Mogami doesn't get. That she should, because you've literally changed the ship from a light cruiser to a heavy cruiser, but that's not how it works. So she's a very, very odd duck. Now, we are going to talk a little bit about the history of the ship, because in order, in order to understand where she is today, you sort of have to understand how broken she used to be and how strong she still can be in the 155 configuration. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the 203 millimeter guns because that is the way the line is quote unquote meant to be played. However, we are going to spend a little, a few minutes when the time comes, we're going to talk through both gun configurations because ultimately which gun type of gun you pick does not change how you play the ship. It might change a little bit the kinds of targets you shoot at, and it might change a little bit the kinds of board positions you select but it won't change how the ship plays. Uh, and it certainly doesn't change her armor scheme, which, by Wargaming's own system, it should, but it doesn't. All right, so let's let's dive in a little bit. I'm going to cover all the basics. We're going to get to the main guns last, because that's where the majority of the conversation is. And then so we're going to talk through everything else first, and we're, then we're going to compare her to her contemporaries as we go. All right, so first things first, let's have a look at survivability. 39,100 hit points is a little sad. It's a little sad for a lot of different reasons. For starters, this is less hit points than Miyoko has one tier down. This is one of the things that makes Mogami so frustrating to play, right? Miyoko is such an amazing ship. She has a tremendous health pool for her tier. The guns are solid. She handles okay, right? The detection is not amazing, but like there's a lot. Miyoko has a lot going for her, right? And then you get to Mogami and you're used to, you're used to, you know, there being notable upgrades when you move from one tier to the next, right? And we've seen it up to the progression of the line. We went from Furutaka, six guns. We went to Alba, still only had six guns, but you got better detection. Um, you got some other advantages, right? Then you move up to Mi Miyoko and your detection gets a little worse, but you get way more guns, you get way more health. It's a nice upgrade. Going from Miyoko to Mogami will not feel like an upgrade. And part of the reason is this health pool. The health pool was essentially the same. It's within 100 points. So that is sad. How does she compare to her contemporaries? You're on the low side. There are a whole, whole lot of proper traditional heavy cruisers in tier 8, most of them premiums, that have more health than this. And of course, Mogami being a tech tree ship in the Japanese um, does not get a heal. So this 39,000 hit points you start with, that's all you get, unless you want to invest in survivability expert for another, what is it, uh, I don't know, three, 4,000 more hit points, which is not a bad way to go. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, like, you don't, there's no heal, so that feels bad. 16% torpedo protection um, is actually on the high end, right? For As cruisers go, Mogami is fairly well defended against torpedoes. But 16% still sucks, right? <laughs> you don't want to take torpedoes. Your health pool can't support it. You're not going to reduce that damage very much. Um, again, especially if you're charging big old Japanese, you know, like Japanese destroyer torpedoes. If these are the little European destroyer torpedoes that hit for six, 7,000 points of damage, all right, fine. It's not nearly as catastrophic. But if you're chasing uh, an American destroyer or, you know, if you're chasing a Fletcher or a Kagero or, God forbid, a Shimakaze, man, you don't want any part of his torpedo armament. He's going to waste you. Um, so yeah, survivability, unfortunately, not something that Mogami does very well. This, of course, also carries over to her armor scheme. Now, this is where some of the differences that we were talking about start to play in. All right, when you get Mogami, Mogami is in a light cruiser configuration. These are 100, these are 
15 barrels of 155 millimeter guns, six inch guns, basically, and you have a 25 millimeter bow. That's pretty good for a light cruiser. Now it's not gonna it's not gonna dissuade 15 inch battleships. They will still overmatch you, but when you're top tier, when you're up against 14 inch armed battleships, that 25 millimeter bow is gonna feel pretty awesome. So unfortunately, regardless of what configuration you play Mogami in you don't get the bow armor of a quote-unquote traditional tier 8 heavy cruiser, the 27 millimeters you would find on a Hipper or a, uh, a Baltimore, for example. Now, the belt armor is the same, right? This is the same. I think, I'm pretty sure Miyoko had 100 mils, you know, because you had, you, had, you had 76 mils down at tier 5 and tier 6. We got a little more armor when we went to tier 7, and Mogami basically rocking the same thing here. I've got, an, I've got a 4-inch, basically, 4-inch belt, from between the barbettes, and then that's it. My deck armor is still 27 all throughout. 30 mils on the casemate, and th on, on this part of the casemate, 27 here between the, the belt and uh, this particular section of the casemate. So all of your upper work, superstructure, deck, call, all of it is full pinnable by regular uh, heavy cruiser HE and most light cruiser HE as well. Almost anything that shoots at you is going to full pin the ship somewhere including the turrets. We've talked about this. We saw it on Miyoko. Still here. You've only got an inch of front plate on these turrets. You will take turret in caps all the time. Does not matter which configuration you play the ship in. You have the same problem on both. The armor layout doesn't change. And that's one of the things I was... I'm, 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 I understand why it is, right? But I genuinely feel like Mogami is one of those ships that almost needs... Uh, like, um, like, uh, they need to, uh, I'll talk about more of that in a minute, but, but I feel like they need two different versions of this ship in order to try and start balancing it a little better. But for, for the sake of the video we're making today, um, the armor scheme is not doing you any favors and your health pool has not materially increased from tier seven. And you're now seeing tier 10 matchmaking. So there is a lot to dislike about Mo Mogami's survivability. You will have a hard time keeping this ship alive. It's just the way it is. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are at cruiser or how bad you are at cruiser. Mogami is going to test you in way and, and punish you in ways that will make you frustrated. And there's just nothing you can do about it. It's just part of it's part of the joy of playing the ship. Let's have a quick look at the Citadel just so you can see what we're up against here. Um, again, we we talked about it earlier from the forward barbettes all the way to the after barbettes. You have a massive Citadel that extends the full breadth of width of the ship. She tries to have a little turtle back action going on here, right? I've got this little 60 millimeter desk slope, but functionally, this is not going to do you much good. You might bounce the occasional light cruiser AP off of this or something, but you can't rely on it for anything. This is not a hipper and don't treat her like one because she will not reward you for it. <laughs> um, Mogami eats citadels at all kinds of crazy angles, at all kinds of ranges. They'll plunge through her deck. They'll kick through her side. You can see, let me try and get a better angle here. You can see how much of the citadel extends above the waterline, right? Like at least a couple of meters here. So you, and it's it's literally, the, the citadel is huge above the waterline. The, at least the magazines are below the waterline or right at, but from this, you know, between the superstructure, uh, it's, it's all citadel and it's well above the waterline. You will get smashed if you turn in front of a battleship and he has AP in the barrel, which he probably will. You're gonna get smashed. Um, you have to be very, very careful with this ship. It cannot take. It just can't take a hit. It just can't. Um, now, at the other end of the spectrum, one of the things she has going for her is her concealment. So, because Mogami is tier eight, she gets access to concealment module, which means you can get the surface detection of this ship down to nine point five kilometers. That is amazing. That is not best in tier, right? It's, but it is really really good. Very few non-Japanese cruisers in your tier can can kind of match you here. Rochester ties you. Uh, Wichita, Cheshire ties you. Um, Harbin is a little better. Hampshire is a little better. And then your premium cousins, Otago and Tone, are also better. But other than that, you basically outspot every other tier 8 heavy, like, cru like heavy cruiser. Um, again, I'm not looking at light cruisers. I'm focusing on heavy cruisers. There are some light cruisers out there that will still outspot you, things like in Edinburgh. So, but the bottom line is, stealth-wise, this is good. You need this to survive. Um, in a perfect world, Mogami is able to engineer a board position where she is the stealthiest thing on her flank um, 
oppose like there are no opposing destroyers that can outspot her right there are no ships on your flank that can outspot you that is the ideal world for mogami because then she controls the engagement she can decide when to fire in other words when to be spotted and when not to be spotted um if there's destroyers around that can outspot you and you don't have destroyers in front of you to help you pick them up that can be a very uncomfortable place to be because you're very fragile you're getting lit someone you know big battleship back there's probably looking for you and you don't know what it is that's spotting you. And as we've talked about with Japanese cruisers, you can't remedy that situation. So Mogami is best when she is playing behind friends. When she's all by herself, depending on the situation, it can be very, very unfortunate. But the stealth is a huge asset. Now, speed. Um, 35 knots base is pretty solid, but tier 8 is a place where things start to even out a bit. Down at tier 7, Miyoko was like, like the fastest tier 7 tech tree cruiser. At tier 8, you can't say that. Um, you're still quite quick, you still have plenty of speed, but of course, Amalfi is better than you, and several other cruisers are up there with you in the tech tree, in the 33 and a half, uh, 33, 34 kind of knot range. You're still faster, but it's not as big of an advantage as you used to have. So you just gotta remember that, right? It's, it's not that you're slow, it's that everyone else catches, closes the gap, and so it's a little less of an asset, something you gotta manage. 750 on the turning circle, 7.1 there on the rudder shift is, I don't believe that's buffed. Um, so that's, that's like full, like just regular stock. I mean, uh, upgraded stock module, upgraded modules and everything. It's pretty good. Really. It's pretty good for a ship this size. That's actually surprising. Now it's not, it's firmly in the middle, right? It's not best in tier. It's not worst in tier. She's got a very long overall length, which is going to impact that turning circle, right? So she's got a pretty good size turning circle, but she's quite pretty responsive. 7.1 for a heavy cruiser is pretty solid on the rudder shift. You'll find when you push that rudder over, she turns. It just takes her a little while to get there because of the size of that turning circle. Ordinarily, we talk about artillery right here in the main battery. We're going to come to that later. Let's finish up the other inherent characteristics of the ship before we talk through the two gun options. Torpedoes. We had four triples on Miyoko. We now have four quads here on Mogami. These are roughly the same torpedoes. Same range. You're still looking at 10-kilometer torpedoes with 62 knots of speed. These ones hit a little harder, I think. Um, I, did, I didn't run the numbers, but I think they're just a little better. You have the same basically the same pathetic firing angles that you're used to on Miyoko. I'll put them up here so you can have a quick peek, but the reality is is that you can fire torpedoes just like Miyoko, just like Alba, a couple of degrees forward of amidships, all the way back to, you know, 30, I think it's about 30 or 35, maybe, maybe I think it's about 35 degrees off the stern. And that's it. That's your torpedo window. So again, like we've been saying, with the preceding two ships, this is not a ship you want to be attempting torpedo charges in. Your torpedoes are there so that when you're running away from someone, you are vomiting torpedoes back in their face and forcing them to maneuver or take damage. Hopefully you get lucky, you land a flood, then you can come in with some fires, right? That's how we stack all the big damage out of these cruisers. But um, but trying to torpedo charge, no, don't do not do that. But you do have four launchers, uh, and they are, they're kind of nice. They're kind of tucked up under here, under the deck. This is nice. They're not exposed, which means that uh, they get knocked out a little less commonly than the ones on, uh, say, Alba did when because they're out on the deck, right? So the torpedoes, a huge asset. We've talked about how to use those before. Not going to belabor the point. Uh, you should be pretty familiar with that by this stage of the line. Airstrike, um, pretty comparable to what we had at Miyoko. I've got two charges now. Uh, two, uh, two, two charges, two bombs each, and you see there 4,800 damage on the bombs. Pretty solid here. Nothing, you know, nothing to write home about, but like for what you're doing, it's great. They do go out to seven kilometers, which I think Miyoko might have stopped at six. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but either way, it's adequate for hunting submarines, right? Especially with your guns and a five kilometer hydro, this usually works out okay. It does not mean you can hunt, you can push a sub when he's got two or three ships backing him up that will shoot you while you do it. Um, but if it's just you and the sub or you and the sub versus a sub and a destroyer, that kind of thing, you can make this work. And these, de these depth bombs hit pretty solidly. A defense. Now there's some good things to talk about here, but they're not amazing. Um, again, we're still lacking a mid range bubble and that's really what hurts these mid tier. And now as we edge into tier, high tier, right? Tier eight now, um, Japanese heavy cruisers from an AA perspective, I have the long range aura based on the 127 millimeter mounts here that work as my secondaries. I have no mid range aura. And then I have all of the inner aura based on the Japanese 25 millimeter guns. So there you go. I mean, just like you had at Miyoko, the numbers are a little better because you have more of the 25 millimeter mounts. But the reality is, is that your AA is basically good for self-defense only. And it's not even really good, not even terribly good at that. You will shoot down some planes it will not prevent strikes. You will not meaningfully contribute to the AA defense of your team. It's just a weakness of the line. 
It's not, I will say it starts to get better at tier nine. Up to this point, it's been abysmal. And at this tier, it remains abysmal. It will start to get better uh, in a little bit. You do finally get a little bit of flack, right? You get four, four flak puffs now. I think Miyoko was stuck at two. Um, and this is with the uh, the commander skill, right? I'm running focus fire training. Yeah. So that's with the bonus, but it's still not bad. It's it's it when you're in conjunction with a couple other ships, your flak plus theirs starts to make an impact, right? But by yourself, mm -mm, this is not your A suite's not going to deter anybody. So just don't uh, don't get excited. Don't rely on it. Um, all right, we've hit all of the important stuff. Let's talk about main battery. Then we're going to move into commander skills, and then we'll finish up with modules and uh, and signals. All right, so let's talk about the main battery. The main battery I'm showing you here is the upgraded module on Mogami, her alternate guns. This ship spawns, when you buy it, will come with 155 millimeter guns, and at some point you'll have to decide whether or not you want to pay XP to upgrade those guns to this. I'm showing you this because these are the guns that you're used to, right? If you've played Furutaka, Alba, and Miyoko to get here, it's the exact same gun. 203 millimeters, 50 calibers, 840, uh, 840 shell velocity, exact same gun. You're on a 14 second reload, uh, and the turret traverse is down to a little under 23 seconds, which is actually pretty solid. That's buffed, right? I've got the little, I've got the little grease the gears skill here on the captain. But this is still really solid. This is a this is a very valid way to play the ship. I for years I have kind of mocked 203 Mogami because there's a there's a Japanese premium available at tier eight, Atago, that is also armed with these exact same guns, but Atago is better, in my opinion, in so many different ways. I mean her A is not better, but like the ship is a little stealthier, it has better torpedo angles, it has a heel, like there's a lot Atago has a lot going for it. It's just a better ship in this configuration. In the process of making this video, what I discovered is this is still not a bad ship. Is it a Tago? No, it's not ever going to be, but it's not bad. And if you're comfortable playing with these guns, if you really enjoyed Miyoko and you don't want to like learn a whole bunch of stuff about armor penetration values and respec a captain and so on, this is the way to go. Okay, this is the way to go. So when you get to the Mogami, you'll have the 155 guns equipped you're going to want to eventually, as quickly as you feel comfortable, spend the XP, buy the 203s, and then the ship is going to play like you are accustomed to. Um, 15.7 on the range should feel the same. I think, I think Miyoko was 15.6, so you're about there. And the shells are the same shells. 3,300 damage on the HE, 4,700 on the AP. You've seen what these guns can do if you've been playing the line up to this point. All right? Now... As far as commander skills go, again, you, you're going to look into configuring this. Uh, I'll get the wrong captain out here, I'm realizing. Um, you're going to configure this very similar to the way that you would configure any other Japanese 203mm armed cruiser. All right, so in my mind, you want to start with Grease the Gears. You want to start with Gun Feeder. One of those two for sure. I would strongly encourage Gun Feeder. I think the 203mm turrets turn quick enough. You want the buff, but you don't need it at first. Pick this up. Then move into probably Demolition Expert. Um, then you're probably going to want Adrenaline Rush and then Concealment for your first 10 points. After that, you can look, start looking around, right? Uh, again, if whatever you haven't picked up for one point, Grease the Gears or Gun Feeder, either one is good. I still really like Fill the Tubes. I think the Torpedoes are good enough to put two points into the reload. Um, I still like Focus Fire Training. You're still a cruiser. The little, ex the little bit of extra A you get when you push your little focus sector button is worth two points, in my opinion. Priority target is an excellent skill for Mogami. We detailed at length how fragile she is. This will give you more information about safe, you know, safe to turn, not safe to turn, detected, not detected, whatever. This is just a great skill to have on the ship. I have survivability expert on this, Captain. That is a personal choice. That's debatable. If you don't want to invest this because it's only worth... Uh, about, I'm going to run the numbers, 3,600 hit points or so. Um, you could invest these three points into something else. Uh, I don't think I'd do heavy AP. You could consider going in on the torpedoes. I don't think that's a good idea. You don't need, well, this, this skill wouldn't do you any good. Well, this skill would counteract your concealment. I wouldn't do that. Um, you could theoretically take these, this point out of last stand, these three points out of survivability expert, put them up into like top grade gunner or something. That wouldn't be terrible. But again, your stealth is so low, you're gonna, you have to remember you're not going to get a ton of use out of this. I'm not sure. It, it, it's kinda, it, it becomes more of a little bit of preference at that point, right? Um, just because there's a lot going on. If you had a heal, I'd, I'd say superintendent. But without the heal, I don't think it's worth putting the points in here. But you're going to spec a 203 Mogami very similar to the way you spec a Miyoko. 
so you know if you got comfortable playing a spec down there, move that spec up here and you're good to go. Okay, let's go back and talk about the 155s. This is this is um this is confusing. In order to help you understand where kind of where Mogami is today and why she is that way, I have to give you a little bit of history. When the game launched, 155 Mogami was basically the most broken ship in the game, and it had to do with the way you could stack commander skills on her. There were commander skills that allowed you to take light cruiser guns of this caliber and accelerate their reload, and I think you added like 20% to their range. And so basically, you didn't have IFHE in that, in that era. There was no way to get more penetration out of the shells. So you're stuck with, you were stuck with the base penetration of, you see there, 31 millimeters. I'll swap captains in a moment, and we'll talk more about why that's important in just a sec. But the reality is, is that this ship was a ridiculous flamethrower. You had 15 barrels, I think, on about a nine-second reload that went out to, I think it was over 18 kilometers. This thing was Kutuzov before Kutuzov existed. They tried several times to try and balance the ship, and they could never really get there. And so finally, in early 2016, they just absolutely nerf-hammered the 155 configuration. They, they started off by yanking the commander skills that were basically breaking the ship out of the game. The one that, the one that buffed her reload and increased her range, those skills just disappeared. And then um, they, they baked all of those uh, inherent abilities the range and the reload buff into the hull of Kutuzov. And so now you had this tier eight premium Russian cruiser that basically took Mogami's place, but you had to buy it. Um, bit of an uproar when that happened, actually, um, because they nerfed the hell out of Mogami and basically Kutuzov was just as abusive, but in that era, Mogami was just inherently better and she was in the tech tree. And then they nerfed the crap out of Mogami and left Kutuzov untouched. And then literally everybody ran out and bought a Kutuzov. And so they were, they were just world of Kutuzovs for a while, right? Certainly in competitive play, they were big, big, big for years because of the smoke and the silly, the silly fire starting capability of the shells. Mogami, in this gun configuration, does not play significantly differently, right? Your gun, your gun range doesn't change. Your gun angles don't change. All of that is the same. The targets you shoot at perhaps changes a little bit. Let me explain. If you're going to build a 155 Mogami, you really, really want a different, a, a captain that is configured for a light cruiser. What, and that, what does that mean? You really want a captain with the IFHE skill, okay? Base, these 155 guns have a base penetration of 31 millimeters. Now, that means if you shoot those shells at basically an opposing light cruiser or an opposing destroyer, you will do horrible things to them. They'll take full pins, they'll catch on fire. It's, it's bad, which is great when you're murdering destroyers. But if you find yourself shooting at something heavier, say a heavy cruiser or a battleship, those shells on their own will shatter much of the time because you're shooting them at stuff that has 32 millimeters of plate in its bow or upper works. And so they can still, a shell that shatters can still potentially light a fire, um, but you won't get full penetration damage. That hurts quite a bit. However, if you invest four points in this IFHE skill, you see over here now, your shell penetration goes up to 38 millimeters. Now I'm getting not only full pin damage, I'm getting less of a fire chance, yes, but I can recover some of that with flags and the demolition expert skill. So it's not so bad, but I'm but I'm now I'm getting the full penetration damage that I really want out of these guns. So the big thing to remember is if you're going to play 155 Mogami, the style of play is the same, but the captain build needs to be a little different. The other thing I'll point out uh, as we head into modules is that the 155 mm turrets turn slower. So you absolutely want grease the gears. Um, you see me here. I'm still rocking gun feeder on this captain. I think if you're going to play 155 Mogami, you have to prioritize grease the gears over gun feeder. These guns only reload every 10 seconds. I mean, that's pretty nice. It's not light cruiser amazing. This isn't a Cleveland, but that's still pretty solid. Um, and so if you need to change to the AP, you're going to have to take, you know, the full duration, let's say. But the Grease the Gears is a much bigger skill for 155 Mogami than it is for 203 Mogami. You absolutely have to, I won't say have to, you really, really want Demolition Expert, though. By the time you pick up IFHE, you want Demolition Expert. It takes more skill points to build an effective 155 Mogami captain than it does a 203. What do I mean? Well, for starters, I have to have two poor four-point skills for the ship to really work. Uh, the way it wants to work, right? So I have to start with, say, grease the gears, probably pick up Demolition Expert, move into Adrenaline Rush, and grab Concealment just to get off the ground. Like, that's probably the first four I would take. 
then you really, really need IFHE, and then you probably want to double back and pick up uh, Focus Fire Training or something like that. But without a 14-point captain, 155 Mogami is really going to struggle to achieve things that 203 Mogami can already do. So it's just a choice. I'll tell you straight up, I think one of the biggest mistakes Wargaming is making right now in the Japanese tech tree is leaving this module in the game, right? This 155 gun configuration really needs to be the alternate. And I, I sent a message to Bog the other day, and I kind of pointed this out. I was like, you guys should really consider this. In my opinion, all the ships up to this point use these 203 millimeter guns. All the ships after it use 203 millimeter guns. This module should be, this 203 millimeters should be the base configuration of the ship. The 155s should be an alternate. If you want to explore this, you want to go backwards in time and play the old configuration, you can. The other thing they could do, and I really hate even suggesting this, is you just strip 155 Mogami out of the game completely. You make her a premium. Now you can balance the armor of each ship according to the gun caliber. Because that's how Wargaming does it, right? Light cruisers and heavy cruisers have different armor thresholds on the bow line up partially historically, but also partly due to how their main battery is sized. Light cruisers inherently have less bow armor than a heavy cruiser. Mogami doesn't suffer this problem. She gets 25 millimeter bow with 155 millimeter guns. She gets basically heavy cruiser armor on a light with a light cruiser guns in this configuration. But I still think it'd be worthwhile to balance the ship a little better than, than she currently is. Personal opinion. But the reality is, is between these two gun modules... It's really all down to captain skill. The play style of the ship is just what you're used to from playing Mogam, uh, playing Miyoko and Alba and Furtaka on your way here. What other um, cons- I mean, um, uh, module upgrades should we be considering? Well, you absolutely want main armaments modification one for the reasons we talked about earlier. You re- desperately need the ability to reduce those end caps on your main battery turrets. I am taking hydro. Again, I do not recommend defensive fire. Um, so hydro here, I've taken the hydro module in, uh, in slot two. If you don't have this, I would strongly encourage engine room protection. Never hurts to have this. I've still got turret traverse in uh, slot three. There's a case to be made even for aiming systems mod. Um, and we'll, we didn't talk about this with the main battery. I didn't put the curves up. But one of the things, we'll go back and talk about that in a minute. Um, I'll point that out as a quirk of the ship. But I still have main battery mod. If you're playing 203 Mogami... Um, I would st- I would also encourage you to consider aiming systems mod. I think you'll get a lot of value out of this particular upgrade. I still think airstrike is the way to go in slot four. I think the steering gear is a little overkill. It's not a bad choice, but it's okay. it's it's. I still think airstrike is better. Propulsion. Uh, I don't think you need this. Uh, you're not going to be spending a ton of time sitting still, which is where you really get value out of this one. And you absolutely have to play concealment in, in, in five. Like this ship can't take hits. Every chance you get to go dark is 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 amazing. Um. Flag's pretty straightforward. I'm running Juliet Charlie. Everything to buff my fire chances. Uh, I'm running the flood chance flags here. I have the AA flag just because I have so many of them. Truth be told, you don't need this, and it's not a huge buff to the ship. Um, Sierra Bravo, if you've got it, great call here. A little buff to whatever you put in your consumable slot choice there. Uh, November Foxtrot and Sierra Mike. Now, one thing I do want to point out about the main battery before we get too far away. I'm going to go back to this real fast. Let's see. Let's come back to here. All right. Now, I've been putting up the accuracy curves as we've gone along the way, but one of the things I discovered about Mogami along the way is that she does not seem to have the same accuracy buff that the other Japanese cruisers in the line have. For example, when I pull up the, uh, let's see, let's pull, let's pull one up here. Let's start with the vertical dispersion curves. This is most of the tier eight tech tree heavy cruisers, right? I've got, on this, on this graph, I've got Mogami, Martel, Hipper, Baltimore, Albemarle, Amalfi, and Harlem. You're seeing now the vertical dispersion. That purple, light purple line at the bottom is Baltimore. She is the best of the dispersion ellipses in vertical dispersion at tier eight. Just above that, the brown and the maroon, that is um, Martel and Albemarle. Above that in the light blue is Mogami. So like firmly in the middle of the pack here, out to about, what is that, about nine or 10 kilometers when they all start to kind of come together. And out at longer ranges, Mogami sort of suddenly overtakes, right? If you look... All the way out at the graph, out, you know, all the way to the right, 15 and a half, 16 kilometers, Mogami overtakes everybody and has the best vertical dispersion. But at short and mid-range, where you ex- where historically the Japanese cruisers up to now have kind of ruled this category, Mogami falls short. What about horizontal dispersion? Here, um, we have the same kind of problem, right? 
Baltimore is best, followed by Baltimore, I'm sorry, about my Martell and Albemarle, and then Mogami. And again, once you get out to about 10 kilometers, Mogami slowly overtakes. But at that short and mid-range where you expect Mogami to really shine, it's kind of kind of not a thing. Don't really understand why that is. Horizontal dispersion. You basically have two classes here in horizontal dispersion. You have um basically Harlem is in a category. That orange line at the top, Harlem is like off by herself. Every other tier eight heavy cruiser is that second line. So Mogami, Martel, Hipper, Baltimore, Albemarle, and Amalfi all share the same horizontal kind of curve there. I don't understand why they've done this. I, I genuinely don't understand why the kind of unique thing about the ship is taken away here, but I wanted to point it out just so that you understand that for some reason, Mogami may feel a little less accurate than Miyoko did, but once you get these shells on target, you'll notice. All right, let's go show you some sample gameplay, and we'll be back here in a minute for a little bit of outro. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our sample game here in 203 millimeter Mogami as we spawn into the top end of North. Now, already you can have a quick look at the team lineups. I'll do this for you and tell that I have lucked out. I am top tier in this match. Now, one of the things that I think surprised me a little bit as I was kind of looking to get a game uh, to showcase to you guys in 203 Mogami is how the ship was better than I remember in this configuration. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still just kind of a... It's still Miyoko, right? And Miyoko up tiers decently, and Miyoko plays okay. And Mogami is basically just more of the same. She's just perhaps a little more vulnerable to incoming fire, as we talked about earlier. So, I mean, she doesn't... Uh, you know, statistically, and we pointed this out, she doesn't have the same accuracy for some reason, but it's not like the guns feel inaccurate. So, yeah, when you're bottom tier, she's going to feel bad, but that's always at tier 8. When you're middle tier, you're going to feel okay, and when you're game like this, when you're top tier, you're going to feel pretty good about your life. And so it goes here as we spawn into the top end of the map. Now, looking over the enemy team, I can see all kinds of things that make me happy and several things that make me sad. One is, I have lots of big, dumb battleships to try and burn down. This always makes me happy in a Japanese cruiser. Unfortunately, I still have two cockroaches, um, submarines, uh, to deal with, and of course, I am going to have to sweat enemy planes, because of course, Mogami's AA is not really all that amazing. Take an early garbage shot at this Fubuki. I badly misjudged it. He is actually slowing down and stopping in that smoke, so uh, those aren't going to those aren't going to land anything. Um, the opposing team also has two radars to our none, and that never is a good feeling. I opted to deploy over here to the western side of the map, which works out for me. But I gotta say, as as the if you kind of take a glance at the mini map as the game develops, I was actually sort of concerned about our eastern flank. There's only four ships over there. The I-56 is apparently already submerged. He's not moving very quick. The Hatsu is charging ahead. And, um, I, you know, it's kind of four on three over there. And I'm going, oh, I hope they can pull that off, right? And the good news for me is that I don't really... I mean, at one point, I look up and I'll point it out. I kind of head over in that direction as, you know, I was like, oh, this is not good. But I don't ever really have to stray too far. Those guys do a good job of, uh, of hanging on and, and making holding that flank steady. But despite having planes, we don't have great vision, do we, right? Like, the Lexington's just now starting to pick up some stuff down here south of the cap. We've got eyes on the Heinrich, the Alinde. There's the FUBU. Put some shots down range at that guy. And uh, the Bama, of course, moving up. The opposing Salmon all the way over on the one line. Solid hit. You'd love getting 10-kilometer hits where you basically strip half a destroyer's health away. And that is one of the things that you can do in these ships. But now... Yes, as an opposing battleship begins to move into range, let's assume the kiting position and start lighting him on fire. Some good full pins there into his upper work superstructure and casemate armor. No fires, unfortunately. Feels bad. He's already turning to move out. He, he wants no part of this. I'm going to get, well, I guess just the one shell there, and, and he's basically going to sail out of my range here in just a sec. I'm going to sh I'm going to lead that salvo to try and judge the turn, and luckily for me, he is going to turn into those shells, and I should, I believe, get a fire out of this salvo? Yeah, feels good. Mogami just doing Mogami things. But as we're both backing off, nothing is in range anymore. I finally do manage to go dark briefly, right about there. Well, it happens, and then... Something picks me up again, and then I go dark again, and anyway, for the moment, all is well. 
Nobody can see me. Nobody can shoot at me. So I'm t I, I take this opportunity. I'm still looking at that eastern flank. I'm very uncomfortable with the amount of ships we have holding that portion of the board. If you look, I'm just going to pause it here. Look at the mini-map. If you are an opposing submarine, destroyer, cruiser, and of course, you don't necessarily know this, but I mean, if you're looking at the map, you could drive right up that gap on the 7-8 line and no one would see you. No one would know anything about it until it was all over, to quote Hunt for Red October. So I'm seeing that on the mini-map, and I'm really kind of unhappy with how the team has deployed. Not necessarily how we're performing. I mean, we, you know, we've killed a destroyer. I'm sorry, we've killed a battleship, they've killed a destroyer. So far, I'm pretty happy with that trade. You know, I've got 20,000 damage. I'm Again, I'm not unhappy, but I'm like, I don't like the long-term um, the long-term implications of that particular particular uh, board board layout. So I'm taking some shots at this FUBU while I've got them because, again, with my dispersion ellipses, I should be trying for these shots. And I'm going to get a little more chip damage out of here. Again, trying to pitch in and help the Icarus do his job. But I'm going to wait for my detection to drop off here. Slowly. It always feels so slow. And then we are going to cut, we are going to beat feet back to the east, just because there's not a lot for me to do on this corner of the map. The opposing team seems to be kind of flexing back towards mid. I cannot run the salmon down while under the Alabama's guns. That's not a thing. Um, the Lexington is continuing to bring his planes over here. In fact, you can see on the mini-map, he's camped out down south of that island. And my AA is not going to contribute to anybody. So at the end of the day, I realized, you know what, this is... Not the, where I want to be on the map. Let's push back farther to the east and try to be a little more useful or impactful, let's say. Five minutes gone. I'm pretty, again, not unhappy with where I am. I just don't think it's a, a recipe for long-term success in this game. And so we are going to go ahead and bail out of here. Waiting for these planes to, to let me go. There we go. Once I'm unspotted, I'm a lot more comfortable. This is one of the arguments. I'll, I'll pause here real briefly, right? We talked um, briefly about this, I suppose, talking about consumables, right? I, I, I strongly encourage you to take hydroacoustic search on Mogami and pretty much all of the Japanese cruisers in this day and age. But the big argument, the valid, uh, I'll say valid, the prevailing argument against it is Japanese cruisers thrive on stealth. And what ruins stealth faster than an aircraft carrier? basically nothing so the ability to potentially push your little planes be gone button and sneak back into stealth is never going to be a bad thing in your japanese heavy the struggle right now is that uh, submarines are tend to be a little more prevalent than aircraft carriers even though aircraft carriers are arguably the bigger threat to you in the long run um it's, it's buoyed by the fact that Mogami's, of course, as we talked about, Mogami's AA suite is not anything to get excited about. So skipping defensive fire on this ship is not as big an impact, not as big a potential impact, let's say, as it might be later on. And we'll talk more about that when we get to Ibuki and Zhao, because their AA suites, while not, you know, like Des Moines level amazing, are certainly better and certainly worthy of consideration when it comes to picking defensive fire for one of your consumables. So now, finally, after seven minutes, Mogami, pause real briefly, Mogami is in her happy place. Check it out. I've got an Alabama crawling up the one line. I've got a New Mexico in my range just to the south of me on the, on the three line. I have all of these big, fat battleships I can shoot at. This New Mexico, I'm super excited to get shots at if I can. But right now, I'm focused on the Alabama because he is unquestionably the bigger threat as the top-tier battleship on the enemy team. Now, I feel, when I'm in this position right here, if you look at the last known position of the Lende, I am, like, super uncomfortable. I'm like, you see on the other side of that Icarus smoke? What's going on? Am I about to get citadeled off the board? But I'm basically in this, I've kind of put myself here. I sort of have to live with it. So I'm just rolling with it. But I am very, very nervous right now while I'm lit, wondering where that Lende is. And then finally you see him pop up there on the map, and I'm a little more okay about it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, do you see? Do you see what's in our cap circle? You can see in there on the left-hand side of the screen an enemy Alba. Somebody had the same bright idea that I did a moment ago looking at the mini-map and realizing we had a giant hole in our defenses. And sure enough, this Alba is going to take advantage of it. I'm going to load the AP as I make the turn, get all my guns on target. Big AP salvo downrange. This guy does not seem to really understand the danger he's in. And four citadels later, he's going to be regretting his life choices. 
At this point, the AP is a bit overkill. Probably one to two salvos of HE will finish him off if I can get him on target. But I'm not leading these very well. I guess I'm 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 just I'm either miss I'm miss underestimating his speed or not leading my shells quite right. I believe that salvo is going to kill him, so I immediately turn and look somewhere else. And then I realize, wait a minute, wait, what? He didn't die? Sure enough, he turned his in. He's dodging these planes, right? I should have stuck with him. This is. This is a lesson. Lear learn this lesson by watching me screw up, ladies and gentlemen. Stay on a target until completion. Like, you know, just the salvo going out doesn't mean he's going to die. Now, this salvo should absolutely finish him. He basically has to hold this turn to avoid the torpedoes. I feel much better about that salvo finishing him off. But before my shells arrive, the KG-5 takes care of it. Now, we were down two ships. At the moment, we've clawed one back as this Allende is moving up very, very aggressively in a bit of a duel with the KG-5 here in front of me. I'm trying to figure out how to get shells on that guy, but at the moment, I'm not coming up with anything given the island cover he's working. So I'm going to turn my guns back to the Alabama. I know where that guy is. I know that I, I know that I can do mean things to him. I burned away a chunk of his health earlier. And I'm trying not to drive out in front of this Alinde necessarily where I'm going to give him crazy good shots because his AP will do mean things to me if I allow it to. Got another fire on the Bama. Get some more shells downrange. Linde is right here in front of me. Hmm. Oh, five on target with the fires and the damage. We put the Alabama off the board. That feels good. So now we're back to parity as this Alinde now getting pushed a little by the Icarus. This is a very, very bold play by this Icarus. But his torpedoes are 100% going to dislodge this Alinde. And so now I'm in a position, pause real briefly, that I don't like to be in in Mogami, and that is I'm in basically what amounts to a point-blank torpedo duel with someone who has a much faster rate of fire than I do, and good AP shells. The only the only thing I got going for me in this situation is the Icarus is probably, arguably, the bigger threat to this Alinde. I'm going to go widespread here, because I want all I really need to do is to land one or force him to maneuver or something. We're going to put AP in the barrel. The KG-5 is going to hit him pretty hard. I'm going to hit him for a little bit, apparently. And then all I have to do is wait for... Oh, I guess he took a torpedo. I'm not sure exactly what happened there. I'm just waiting for him to drift into one of these torpedoes. But the KG-5 is going to come in and seal the deal. All right. Now we're up a ship. Three unanswered kills starting to feel a little better as we cross over the halfway mark of the game. Now I feel much better about pushing out... Ah, there goes the uh, uh, opposing cockroach on the other flank. That feels good. And so now I feel very very comfortable about moving out here and taking on this New Mexico. For starters, I have nearly twice his speed, and my shells are basically guaranteed to full penetrate his entire top sides, his casemate armor, his superstructure. I'm going to be doing full pin damage all day long. I'm going to be lighting fires. This guy is, if he continues to sit out here and play with me, he's going to very, very be very, very unhappy in a very short amount of time. Even without coming into torpedo range, I can chew this guy up. It's only, it's just a matter of time before that finally occurs. Now, I'm not getting big hits here. At these ranges, you can, the, 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 the dispersion ellipse is starting to feel a little trolly. There's the submarine, presumably driving at us. So I'm going to lay one set in front of him. I'm intentionally holding the second set right now. There we go. That's a much better set. Much better hit with the full pins. I'm intentionally holding the second dive bomb strike until he pings again. I want better, a better sense of where he is. I don't want to blow both of them right away. There he is on the surface. Icarus is picking him up. I love all of this because the Icarus is a fabulous submarine hunter with his little hydro and his amazing British depth charges. That guy is going to be amazing. Now, I'm making this turn here in front of New Mexico, but I'm going to short I'm going to pull the handbrake. His dispersion doesn't do him any favors. There we go. I get some more full pins on him. And now I'm just waiting. I'm holding both of my airstrikes, waiting for this Icarus to pick this guy up. He hasn't done it yet, but I'm going to go ahead and dump them out here speculatively, trying to give him a little bit of a hand as he starts dropping his, his depth charges on top of that salmon's head. We've gone on about a six, un uh, six unanswered kill streak here as a team. That feels really good. The Lexington finally does bag our New Mexico as the KG-5 and I are punishing this surviving New Mexico as the Icarus is trying to finish off the Salmon. But at the moment, the Salmon seems to have gone deep, or the Icarus' Hydro is not up, and the Lexington, unfortunately, is going to bring in the Dive Bombers. Now, I'm not sure where the Salmon is. All he has to do is get back to Periscope Depth to spot this Icarus for the Dive Bombers. 
and that's probably going to feel really, really bad for the Icarus. He might may have to consider using one of his fancy little quick smokes. KG5 hits, gets a good hit in the, in the new mechs, and I burn him out, and that always is, uh, is a nice feeling. All right, so here we go. Submarine hunting time. Now, definitely have an advantage, right? Because I've got a, I've got a Hydro Destroyer out in front of me. All of, his, all of his depth charges available. We are basically sitting, sitting pretty right now. We know he's out in front of us somewhere. He hasn't pinged in a bit. Planes are spotting. This planes are spotting this Icarus. Lexington's trying to get a dive bomb strike on him. Looks like he's going in right about here. Yep, trying for the strike. Coming up empty. And there, right there, he pings. I'm assuming, I, I make a quick decision. I assume he's moving south. He is. There come the four bow tubes. Yep, he's moving right up into it. I put my Hydro up, and bam, I've got him at Periscope Depth with my Hydro. So we're going to get catch him with a couple of shells, and then two splash damages. All kinds of all kinds of flares and floods. He absolutely has to DCP that. And now, I'm waiting for the next set of charges to go in. His DCP will probably have expired by then. I just need to get, I need to get, it, need to get him to... There we go, a direct hit and a splash. Big damage on that guy. Just need to get him... Nope, okay, he still has not, he must have DCP'd on the second iteration there, because now I was basically like, okay, all I need to do is for you to, 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 to be leaking fuel, and I'll know exactly where to look. But he tries to come back to periscope depth. I'm literally right here waiting for him with my hydro, and there we go. If my, my hydro is out to five kilometers and at periscope depth, I will pick you up and my guns can do horrible things to you. Okay, so now we're down to just the opposing Lexington. Game basically in the bag here. All I have to do is just not die. Now, the opposing Lexington is going to take some pot shots at me here with the rockets. These rockets, if I turn broadside, will actually hit me pretty, pretty decently. But going bow on like this, he's not going to get much. He doesn't really get a good drop off there. And uh, yeah, not fussed about it. But now with the Massachusetts and the Catalonia in the cap, the Lexington kind of has bigger problems than me. I presume, based on his last position at the minimap, that he is turned turn his beating feet back to the east. So I'm going to keep pushing almost due south. I'm trying to get basically kind of the eye line band into my gun range. And then I figure sooner or later, between the planes or the Massachusetts, we'll pick him up and I'll, have, I'll be able to angle a little more back to the east and get some more guns on target. I am still faster than this Lexington by about five or six knots. He can, I think he cranks out about 29 or 30, and here I am sitting at about 36 and change. So I can eventually slowly close the gap. It just depends on, you know, uh, relative angles to each other and so on and so forth. He is trying to drop the Massachusetts and the Catalonia, but that's not going to go all that well for him. And uh, excellent there we go, inside my gun range, and uh, that's exactly what we want to see, ladies and gentlemen. And so now, let us unleash the firepower of this fully armed and operational Japanese 203mm high explosive onto the flight deck of USS Lexington. Now, again, I misjudge his speed, he's a little quicker, my shells are a little slower, but I still get basically 10k and a fire out of that salvo. Of course, the way damage control works for an aircraft carrier, the fire goes away instantly, and uh, that's not going to be amazing. He's actually conning his ship here. He pulls the brake. I don't get a tremendous amount of damage out of that salvo, and he's turning in now, trying to go bow into the Massachusetts, I think, just trying to kind of stem some of the incoming damage, but this guy's caught out. It's only a matter of time. The question is, who gets the kill? And the answer is yours truly. Feels good. So a nice all-around game here in Mogami. I feel like you get to highlight a couple of things, right? She does... She, as, as we've talked about up, up the line, right, she does uh, catastrophic things to lighter units that fall under the, the shells of her HE, by which I'm saying submarines and destroyers. I mean, when I can turn and shave half the HP off an opposing destroyer with one salvo, that feels... <laughs> I love that, but the opposing destroyer is like, ow, ow, ow. Japanese heavy cruisers can absolutely do that. Here's the trick somebody else has to do the spotting, right? Unless you are charging into their smoke and they're silly enough to sit in there with your hydro ticking, you know, you're going to, you know, that's just, you don't have all the tools to spot them at longer ranges. But when you see an opposing destroyer, when someone else is spotting that guy at long range, absolutely take the shot. What else did we get to see? Mogami's AA suite is thoroughly mediocre. Even if I'd had defensive fire in that game, it would not have been a significant improvement, right? The hydro, of course, coming in very handy there at the end, able to put, put, uh, put pay to the opposing submarine. And able to flex 
the kind of kiting style of play I've been encouraging that I think the ship really lends itself to. Now, like we've talked about with Miyoko and, and the other heavies up to this point, if you need to push, you can. You saw me doing it here up against the Lexington at the end of the game. But you, when you do that, you're all in on the guns, right? When you are pushing, the torpedo angles will not allow you basically to do much else. Solid, uh, solid XP result here. Um, 2,400 and change base. So almost 1,000 next over the uh, the guy in second place, that Catalonia over on uh, the eastern flank who had a great game. Um, and then, of course, the damage, right? The 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 All the damage. Basically, I, I won't say I soloed the Salmon, but I did a tremendous amount of damage to that guy. And then a lot of good fire damage on the two big battleships, the Bama and the New Mexico. And then, of course, some late game damage on the on the Lexington, the big AP salvo on the Alba. I think I only fired the AP like, like twice this game, right? And that's the thing with... The Japanese heavies. You're gonna you're gonna rely on the HE to do most of the heavy lifting, but you cannot forget your AP, right? When you when somebody shows you that shot, your AP is absolutely worth it, and your accuracy makes it very 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 deadly. So keep that in mind, and don't for, don't sleep on the AP. This is not American piercing with the crazy penetration angles and all that, but it is still perfectly good heavy cruiser armor piercing. All right, guys, there we go. That is Tier 8 Imperial Japanese Navy Cruiser Mogami. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. I hope you can kind of appreciate some of the differences between 203 and 155 Mogami. Play the ship, pick a configuration that works for you, and have a good time. You guys, wash your hands, be safe. I'll catch you later. Peace.